Hello and welcome to Movies and Tea, the final episode of the season. Um, we closed out our d- celebration of female directors by looking at 2019's The Farewell from Lulu Wang, uh, starring Aquafina. As a Chinese American who, learn, upon learning that her grandma for only a short while to live, teams up with the rest of her family to pull an elaborate lie as they decide not to tell her of her impending death, but instead decide to schedule a family gathering under the guise of an impromptu wedding instead. The film itself, based on the on director Wang's life experiences, and first public discussed as part of her radio story, What You Don't Know. The film itself literally translated as Don't Tell Her. Um, the film itself, unfortunately, was snubbed to a number of awards, only getting a nod at the BAFTAs for Best Film in a Foreign Language. It would even felt many feeling that the film had been unfairly snubbed, and then kind of making it something of an undiscovered and underappreciated classic. Of course, we will find out just how underappreciated as we look at the film this evening. I'm, I'm Howard. And you listen to Movies and Tea. Let's take it to the booth. So, here we are, obviously looking at uh, 2019's The Farewell. Um, a film that I personally was very excited to see. It's been on my sort of watch list for a while, and it's certainly a film that's made over on the Asian Cinema Film Club. It made the most recent edition of their Top 50, uh, when it was obviously picked by Stephen Palmer over there. So, the fact that um, it obviously received such high rates of recommendation, along with the fact it stars Aquafina, they had a lot of things going for it, going into it. But this is a film very reminiscent to the likes of Goodbye Lenin, and to an extent, Ang Lee's The Wedding Banquet, the idea of a wedding uh, being the sort of focal point for a more elaborate con being pulled. But, um,. Kim, I mean, how did you find the farewell? I mean, I really love the farewell. It's um, it's definitely one of the, I guess, one of the standout movies I watched this year. Probably. Um, I mean, I'm not usually into movies that are, um, I don't know, nominated <laughs> for things in whatever Academy Awards or whatever awards, but um, the farewell is is is. A lot better than I expected it to be, I guess. It was, um, I mean, I've never lived through, you know, despite my background, I've never had to live through something like lying to my, you know, some relative about them dying. <laughs> mm. So to me, this was kind of a little wacky, but at the same time, I kind of understand what they were trying to portray with um, kind of uh, East versus Western type of culture and the clash of of you know different i guess uh just views on how certain situations should be treated yeah definitely so i've certainly been in a a more in sort of a similar sort of situation um the fact that my grandmother had cancer and survived cancer without me even being told um so I fully understand this sort of situation where the, a family member would have like a terminal disease and decide to hide it from the rest of the family. Only in this case, it's obviously the family that hides it from the person who's suffering the uh, the disease. So it's certainly a, it's a very unique sort of concept. But at the same time, it's a very sort of heartfelt and touching film that has this sort of gentle sort of comedy that runs throughout it. It's very reminiscent to the likes of like you know Lost in Translation. Uh, which kind of makes it really fitting, the fact that this was picked up by A24, who've just recently released On The Rock, Sofia Coppola's latest uh, film. And, as I said, it's just, it's a very it's strange to think that this film didn't obviously get picked up. I don't know whether it was just the fact it's a film predominantly in uh, Chinese that puts a lot of people, made it sort of less accessible and made it sort of more... Just um, sort of create that that divide because it's very even though it's obviously shot in 
predominantly in Chinese, it's obviously got a very sort of Western feel to it, especially in terms of how the film is sort of like shot and the story's told. Um, it doesn't feel like a, a traditional sort of foreign language film. Uh, yeah, I mean, it. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to tell whether it's a Chinese or an American film. For, for myself, yeah, yeah. obviously, you know, as a, as a as a Westerner, I mean, this is obviously when I look at like, a, you know, and I look at like Hong Kong cinema and Chinese cinema and, and certain like Japanese cinema, there's a very sort of difference in how yeah, yeah, yeah. it's told and certain sort of like character quirks and whatnot. And I didn't see any of those sort of things here. It felt like, um, as I say, it just felt like I was watching like a couple of movie, but it just happened that all the characters <laughs> speak in Chinese. So. I, th- I think for me, it's a little bit of a different experience because I didn't really have to read any subtitles. I understood everything that was going on, uh, yeah, English and obviously. Mandarin. And I, it was just um, for like, I understand what you're trying to say. In reality, I, I do. I do agree because just the storytelling wise, um, it's very much more westernized in the sense that it's more of a dramedy than a drama. Because if it was really, um, I guess, Chinese <laughs> movies, uh, they have more of a sense of dra- dramatic storyline. Like, they would take a more dramatic route. Um, I mean, even between all of the Asian movies, like Korea and China and, and um, Japan, just for examples, like all of them have a different way of approaching drama and how they would approach, say, a story like this. And I can, in in general, I can kind of see how each of them would have taken it like a different way. <laughs> uh, but I mean, this is a, I mean, the Pharaoh has a really good tone. Like you really see her, I guess, in some ways you really see Billy, which is played by Aquafina, really take on this, uh, Billy starts realizing, um, I guess learning about the different cultures and slowly accepting it, seeing, I guess, the purpose behind it. Uh, Because in the end, the general concept is that the family is bearing the emotional burden and and what, and then they made, you know, they kind of judge, uh, they kind of like um, said it in the beginning where the reason why they don't tell them is because, don't tell, say, the the, uh, grandmother is the fact that when the family bears their emotional burden, sometimes, most of the times, patients have issues with it. What kills them is knowing that they're going to die. So, I mean, obviously, the ending of this movie is a very good note, um, of reflective of, you know, the, the actual person that this is based on. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's kind of funny that uh, we have that that you obviously say like the reason that the family decide to to pull this uh, sort of elaborate scheme that they do, um, and you obviously have a mother who sort of says that um, that I think she says that it's like there's a the Chinese have a, have a saying it's sort of like people with uh, people with cancer die, and then there's this long pause, and I was like thinking that's not a very good saying. Um, <laughs> But I just understood. It is very interesting, obviously, seeing the, you know, the this obviously the with the culture aspect of like you know, the idea that you don't want someone to be so caught up in the, in the fact that they're going to die. You want them to be celebrating their life, and the best way to obviously do that and bring everyone together is by under the sort of guise of a happy occasion like this wedding. Um, in turn, it does obviously create this really funny sort of situation where you've got this couple that are essentially only been together a couple of months and now being forced into having this marriage and you've got the grandmother who's completely clueless of what's going on around her and is like saying oh the bride she doesn't look happy enough why is she not doing this and he feels so sorry for this poor bride who's sort of like been dragged <laughs> into this Family and, and on top of that, she understands like zero of what's going on because she's Japanese. So everyone's having all these things around her and she just doesn't understand what's going on. And I, I kind of understand because it's also the same way that Chinese people communicate in a different way. And a lot of times if you don't if you don't really understand the language or whatnot, it sounds like they're having an argument a lot. And a lot of times it isn't. It's just the way they talk. And I mean, I know my husband said that before to me when I talked to my mom. Um, 
So, like, for her, it's kind of like, you hear these things, and it's, it, for her, I think it's just this confusing experience where she's here, and she has to, she, she has to get married to this guy, and she, <laughs> and then there's this elaborate wedding, and they have to, you know, there's, like, a bunch of people, and you have to pretend to be happy while, while knowing, and, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, it's just a little crazy, right? Because she's kind of being bossed around also, right? She's like, oh, don't do this and don't do that. And she's kind of in the background. You don't really talk a lot about her. She just kind of sits there and she doesn't say anything until it's really the time, like, until it's, like, the wedding, right? And even then, the focus is more on um, the groom because he's the he's the cousin. And you start seeing kind of a little bit more of, um, I guess, how it's affecting everybody as the movie goes along, right? The emotional burden that each of them have and how each of them are showing their, you know, how it's bothering them in their own way. Like, Yeah, definitely so. And I mean, I just love the whole... When it comes to the to the culture of the Chinese the Chinese wedding banquets, and when we obviously had the wedding banquet before with like uh, with Ang Lee's film, which was just an absolute favorite of that of uh, that season, I thought that was just such a an absolute hidden gem of a movie. I remember I think I watched it like three or four times um, just when we were coming up to doing that recording. I just enjoyed it so much, and the wedding banquet moment scenes that we have throughout this film are just so fun as well. Um, well, probably not as elaborate. They just the little setups that they have when they're doing like the photography and um, just uh, the actual sort of planning sort of aspects. Of it. I just thought they were just like really fun, and it's just really interesting to obviously see. I mean, obviously for yourself, Kim, I guess it's just a little old hat, but uh, you know, for myself, who doesn't get invited to a lot of wedding banquets, it was quite a fun. It's always fun to see those sort of sequences. So I mean. It- different everywhere i've never actually been to a wedding in in china so i or or even in hong kong i've never been to a wedding unless i was like one and i didn't remember anything um uh, but yeah i mean i've been to wedding banquets in you know montreal <laughs> for chinese people uh which is very different it's very westernized but um but so i know this is still different for me and i think the focus of the wedding is really that Uh, I think for a fun fact, I actually think for a fun fact, and I don't know if they meant to do it, is that they use the wedding to be kind of the purpose to bring everyone together um, so that, you know, grandmother can have her last days and see everybody before she dies, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's kind of an excuse for everybody to come back and, and, you know, it's a great one. But at the same time, I also think that there's kind of a thing is that Chinese people also, I mean, like ancient times people used to do that, is that when crap goes on in your family, you usually will use a happy event to bring back like good luck into your family. And weddings is one of the ways to do it. So I don't know if that was kind of like a hidden message, if you know a little bit more about Chinese culture or something, or if it was meant to be, but I, I actually thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, w- I was wondering, you know, maybe grandma doing that whole, like, ha, ha thing really helps, uh, re- oh, and she's it, doing the no, tai, chi. tai Chi. That was just like, um, that was just Isn't like workout it? stuff. It was like, it, it's my mom used to do it when I used to do it with her when I was like eight or 10 or something like that. I think between eight to 12, I still did it with her. She used to do these different exercises and to other people in the world, it looks like you're doing nothing like there's no heart rate increase there's nothing you're just moving very small movements and 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 it's supposed to help you with like your joints and make your body feel better and that's that's what it all says (laughs) but yeah i mean um but yeah i mean she was she was doing all those things and the point of it was she was saying you know you get out all the bad energy type of thing and it, yeah. a part of me was kind of like, uh, maybe that's what because she was doing all that. That's that she's, you know, <laughs> she's still in such good health for someone that has like terminal lung cancer. This, uh, there's a lot of things in the in this world that I don't understand. And certainly a lot of these sort of like hotel sort of health practices and stuff. I would say that they do have a lot of, they do have something to them. Um so yeah, this idea of you know cleansing your 
and cleansing yourself through these um, sort of movements I can fully get behind so even though I don't obviously do those sort of things myself because uh, we don't we just don't uh, have that sort of culture so maybe if we did we'd be like a lot more I don't know you just have to see like I don't know because here it's it's just a, like my mom used to do it at our at this like park area like this clearing in the neighborhood and her friends would gather together and they'd they just do it all together, <laughs> and it used to be kind of embarrassing because <laughs> everybody we, we knew everybody kind of like all the Chinese people, and you know I had friends that were in the neighborhood. And then right across the street from my bus stop, when I was waiting for the bus, was my mom doing this exercise with her friends. So <laughs> <laughs> it's like now that, that's not my mom. <laughs> just, just drive, drive. <laughs> I never heard it's be really interesting scene in terms of like um, the culture point is when they go to the grandfather's yeah. grave and they're giving doing the offerings and um, they're obviously they're doing like the the breaking the flowers and stuff so that someone else can't steal them for their shrine, which I thought was really funny. This is so many funny little moments in that whole sort of sequence and like when the fathers are like lighting cigarettes um, for the grandfather and they're sort of like oh he. He can have a smoke, and she's like, "No, he quit." He's like, "No, he he never quit. He just hid it from you." Um, I just just really liked that scene. I thought that was a very, as it felt very typical of, of a lot of sort of like of my sort of things I've seen like with nation cinema. It felt very sort of typical of the human. That made it so sort of hard to play. So obviously we have here have like a uh, Chinese American director who's working with many Chinese American cast members. Um, and so, so it's very hard to like say, do we classify this as a foreign language film? Because obviously, it's a, um, it's a predominantly sort of like Asian cast and crew, obviously speaking in um, Mandarin. Uh, but at the same time, everyone's pretty much based in the, in the states that's working on this. So it makes it very difficult to sort of place is this like a, a Western film just intentionally shot in. Um, Mandarin, or do we classify it as a foreign language film? So, this when when I was saying before, like obviously with like uh, with those sort of quirks, and I think certainly when you have the the scene where they're at the shrine, I think it really sort of plays up more to sort of like things that we've seen. Obviously, like when you know when like Ang Lee does his foreign language films, it sort of felt felt more like a for like. For like for like that than sort of like anything that we'd sort of see in sort of more traditional sort of Western cinema. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think I think you know any movie like this really, especially if you base it out of you know, I, I think why it should be a foreign film is any time that you have like ninety percent of your movie is subtitled, then it probably should be considered a foreign film. And this was filmed, I think, probably mm. mostly in China. I think they filmed, I think, the majority of the time in China. They spent like what. Very little time, like that. Even the movie itself spends, spends very little time in New York, um, but but I mean, I love, I do love that <laughs> that gray scene. Not only because of you know just how they did everything, and um, it kind of reflects on the culture of the people. And <laughs> I really loved how it entered into the grave, where it was like right as they cued like the fact that there's <laughs> that China. It's all a big show and you have to, and they hire this professional, these professional criers to kind of amp up the drama when the family can't do it type of thing. Um, <laughs> I think that's kind of wild. I mean. <laughs> I was really surprised by that because I thought it was just like, um, it was something that was done like back with the Romans because obviously it was a state sign of your status really the fact that you could you paid like professional mourners to turn up at your funeral to make sure you had a good crowd um, for your sort of send up you could actually pay professional mourners to turn up and uh, and wail for you so I didn't it surprised me the fact that they have them um, still now in sort of like in um, sort of like modern I just culture, find it so. really weird I think it's I think it's for me it's really different of um, I guess I guess it's just like in China, maybe that's a big thing. I don't know. I mean, having uh, putting up appearances and everything is really important. I mean, face is a big thing that, you know, Chinese people always talk about. We always hear about it. It's kind of reflective of your pride, of your, you know, your person. It, it reflects on your family. It's, it's, it's very, very deep. But at the same time, for me, it was so weird because um, I remembered uh, when I had my dad's funeral, there was a lady that wouldn't let me cry. It was... 
wildest thing. It was the wildest thing I experienced. Some lady told me to not cry because she was like, you don't want your parents, you don't want your dad to be like, because we all believe in afterlife, right? So you don't want your dad to believe that um, there's something left behind in this world. You know, he needs to leave in peace so that he can reincarnate and, you know, come back to you know, reincarnate. So to yeah. me, that was so conflicting because when we had obviously the funeral here, there was someone who specifically told me that that was you know, not right to do. And over there, it's kind of all of a sudden I'm hearing about these professional cars, which are completely new to me. But I thought it was just so wild because the next scene that they talked about it, it was like some lady that you never saw in the movie wailing at like the screen. And I just thought that was so entertaining. <laughs> You see, I thought she was at some a different shrine. I didn't realize she was at the family, um, a shrine really. So I, I didn't realize that she was a professional mourner they hired. I mean, it's only something I need to look into. I need to find myself like a bosomy casket jumper <laughs> or something to for when my time comes. Cause I'm I'm totally down with the professional mourner types. It's uh, you know, because you don't know if your friends are going to be filling that limber to fulfill such requirements by the time your time comes. So. <laughs> It's good to back your options. Um, but yeah, it's as I say, it's always interesting when you obviously look at like how different cultures um, you know handle handle or celebrate death. And certainly if you look at like Mexican culture which sort of doesn't see funerals as a sad occasion but a way to celebrate people's lives and you have things like Day of the Dead and whatnot and you have like Sicilian villages where people would just like ab like openly wail and tear at their clothes and things so it's very interesting um just how different cultures handle the idea of deaths and how you conduct yourself at funerals much less you know your where you go from from here you know whether it's this is it or the reincarnation or afterlife and i know for myself i'm certainly exploring a number of options I like to keep open. I don't know what's going to happen, as I said, when the time comes. It's good to keep your options open. Um, no, maybe just holding out for Valhalla. <laughs> Who doesn't want to be carried away by busty women to go and feast for all eternity? <laughs> <laughs> but um, obviously, back to this film. That was uh, that was Death Chat. Um, <laughs> Obviously, at the uh, center of the uh, film, we have Orkafina here playing a surprisingly dramatic role for her, especially since we've come to expect her to as a more of a comedic force in films, often playing the, you know, the wacky friend or just the really sort of more colorful character. I mean, as she's sort of like really honed in on that style of comedy, as she's obviously become more developed in her, in her sort of... Um, Established in in a sort of career. I mean, when it comes to Aquafina, I mean, this is someone I first thought I discovered as a rapper. I used for the documentary Bad Rap, and when she's doing things such as like you know my Vag and Green Tea with um, uh, Margaret Chow, which is obviously like you know parodying this uh, idea of how Asian rappers have to uh, like seen that they just like constantly play up the there as sort of ethnic background and stuff so she's always been like someone who's never been sort of afraid to sort of like go there in like a comic comedic sense and um much like margaret cho just like completely push boundaries and limits and stuff so it's been interesting to see her like evolve from her rap career into like an interacting career and we saw her doing things such as like oceans eight um and bad neighbors too and uh here she does a really phenomenal role so sort of, like purely dramatic role um even though we're at the start it thinks that you think she's going to be like you know the her usual sort of fast talking self when we see her on the street uh in new york and she's sort of like going back and forth uh between talking to her aunt in the hospital and talking to um sort of like a street canvasser and it's kind of funny as well when you compare like how she talks and how her aunt talks that they're both very sort of similar even though there it seems like they're coming from sort of like different sort of uh, standpoints. I mean, they both uh, sort of lie about what they're doing, and I have to say though that uh, Okafina's Billy isn't the smartest to in the shed if she thinks that her aunt's house sounds like a hospital. Her, oh, <laughs> well, she's talking to her grandmother, but yeah, I mean, 
<laughs> I I think it's just the fact that things are like muddled in the in the background, right? And from the intercom, and they yeah. I, I, she she knows something is wrong because she keeps pressing the fact of whether it's wrong or not. Um, but uh, like something like she when when grandma calls her back later on in the day, she's like, "Oh, is everything okay?" Type of thing, right? So she, I think she knows what's going on, but I think that I think you just nailed what, what this movie is is because while we're talking about this big lie that they're 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 kind of trying to hide from grandma in reality everybody is lying to everybody in their everyday life and that's and i think that in essence is is a culture that a lot that a lot of chinese people have especially because a lot of chinese people leave home um in order to either move to other parts of china or move away to um, you know other countries in order to for jobs or whatever and that's one of the things is that Parents don't want kids to worry, so hence why grandma is coughing and she doesn't want to tell her kids about it. And when she goes to the hospital, she doesn't want people to know. And and at the same time, everybody has their own issues, but no one is telling, no one is telling each other about anything. So everybody is lying, having you know what the doctor in in the hospital called a good lie. It's a good lie. So if mm. it's a good lie, it's harmless. It's meant to be. It's meant to, you know, kind of make everyone feel better. And I guess in, in reality, it's just so that people don't worry about you. Yeah. Um, I really also love the grandmother character uh, here played by uh, Zhao Xu Zhen, who's best known really as a theater actor. So this is really sort of like one of her rare sort of moves into, into sort of like cinema. I mean, her only other sort of really sort of role that she's done, she was in the story of Ming Lan, um, which is was released around the same sort of time as a sort of TV drama, and there's just something about the grandmother character who's just, um, I don't know, she's just just this really warm, warm grandmother sort of character. I just like to see her nene, um, and the relationship that she has with Billy and the rest of the family members is just really touching to see. She's even though she's obviously she's um suffering this terminal disease, it never seems to like slow her down at all. She's just um and I think you you appreciate the fact that the fact her family are hiding this secret from her just so that she continue living such a, a happy and fulfilled life that she does. Um it's just, just a really great performance really and it's just seeing whenever like her and Orkvin are just like doing off, off as sort of like the and you have scenes just like grandmother and granddaughter it was just really it just really really touch and see and like any time again any time you see the family sitting around the dinner table which is about three quarters of this movie um the back and forth conversation in this film just feels very natural it just feels like everyone's got such great flow to it so <laughs> you know with the amount of Chinese movies we watch and how many dinners that the Chinese people have had, all you think about is Chinese people yeah. all bond over dinner. <laughs> it's a good, it's an idea I can get behind. And so I want that rotating table. I've never seen a table that rotates the food around like that. You've, that so you've cool. never seen that? Have you not been a Chinese restaurant? <laughs> well, no, because... We d no, I've never been in like a Chinese restaurant where we have a rotating table. All Chinese table. restaurants are round really tables like... with rotating in the center if it's big enough. <laughs> oh, we do we just do not have that at all. Uh, we just have a have like you know, you pick. We don't have this. Um, I don't know that sort of traditional sort of dinner sort of setup. I mean, we if you have like a buffet place, it's all like in steam yeah. baths, and you you go and you come back. But we never have like that. Where it's in the middle and it's sort of like being yeah. slowly rotating yeah, like, around the table. Like Chinese buffet, like. that makes sense. But if you're talking about like a Chinese <coughs> restaurant, if you have over 10 people, yeah. like 8 to 10 people on your table, there will be a rotating thing in the center for you to be able to get all your food. That's why you have like, yeah, that's why Chinese, like, that, Chinese so. people or Asian culture likes round tables more. Because it's like, a, you know, we like the round stuff and not like the square rectangle shaped tables. Yeah, it it just happened around <laughs> here. So, but I think I think it's really I I think it's really good because they had a lot of 
really key conversations that were around the table, you know, while they were having dinner, you know, one of them was obviously about the different views and kind of double standards on how people view, you know, how much you should, you know, how you shouldn't criticize China, but at the same time, <coughs> America's a better place, but then it's not better than China, but then everybody wants to tell their, let their kids go to America. So you have this kind of like conflicting, um, values of east and west and you know just uh i guess patriotism to a certain level uh i mean you had you had obviously the opening part of you know when she first arrived and they're having dinner and you know making food and all that stuff and you have you know the 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 uncle and dad drinking at the table with grandma and that sort of thing and you just have all these little things that happen around the dinner table and I do agree it's a it's like a big part of the movie and a lot of key things happen um but uh yeah I mean I think I think to me though the two parts that were probably the most heartfelt and emotional was I mean in the end when she was having that conversation with her mom about wanting to stay in China um and then a kind of like um having this chat about you know her memories and how you know they're not there anymore and you know, just, uh, it's kind of like how she's not like her mom in the sense where her mom treats this in a different way, but at the same time, she wants to be here because, you know, even though she can't do anything, at least it's a part of her memories that, that she can have, you know, it's kind of, you know, like grandpa died, she wasn't there for it, and now grandma's going through the same thing, and she doesn't want it to be the same way, where, you know, this person exits her life, and, and you can't, you know, there, there's nothing that, there's nothing that she can do about it kind of thing, right? And, and it's going to be another memory yeah. that distance her, distances her from her birthplace pretty much. Uh, because, I mean, essentially what it is is Billy is born in, was born in China and then she was taken care of by her grandparents at a young age before they immigrated to America at a, you know, at a young, at a young age. So that, that, you know, that backstory is, is, I think, a lot of people can relate to that in the sense where, you know, um, there's a lot of things that you can't, I think for me, especially now in the pandemic, it, it's really tough because you, you listen to her talk about that. And for me, I thought it was kind of, I mean, the first time I watched the movie, I didn't really feel it as much. But the second time I really felt what she was saying, because now that we're in the pandemic and, um. I mean, I've been postponing my Hong Kong trip for a while now. I have this issue where I, you know, I start thinking about things that I'm going to miss that's, you know, in Hong Kong and whatever that I should have done earlier. <laughs> you know, all the, the grandmothers or grandmother is getting older and you, you don't know what's going to happen. And you don't know how all the pandemic is going to be and, you know, all these memories. And you just kind of think about it every once in a while. And I kind of like when you when I was watching this movie, a lot of those feelings came back and you know that's one of the you know that's one of the parts that i i particularly thought was really good i mean other than you know the ending part where grandma and her were ha was having that conversation and she kind of like fesses up for the first time about not getting into her fellowship yeah i mean there's a lot of um aspects here and for myself it felt very much like with billy's return to uh, to to China, that in many ways it's also a rediscovering of mm -hmm. her culture, the fact that she's become very sort of immersed in sort of the American culture, and that there's many of these sort of traditions and ideals that she sort of rediscovers and rediscovers herself in many ways, just through taking this trip and reconnecting with her grandmother. And there's little quirks that um, that her fam family have, like um, her other grandmother, a uh, little Nene played by Lu Hong, who's married to uh, Mr. Lee, who she's not really particularly interested in, but she sees it as better than living alone. Um, which is kind of kind of funny. And that uh, Billy's kind of like, like shocked. She's like, why are you living with this person you actually have no sort of interest in? And Mr. the character of Mr. Lee just seems to be off in his own sort of world. I mean, he's he gets up from the table because he does, once he's finished eating, he has no desire to sort of stick around and have conversations just wanders off and stuff so <laughs> I think it was a very so it was a funny it's a funny little sub plot that you got um happening there just like little no relationship with her 
a husband of sorts. So. Yeah, but I think I think it's also a little res- uh, reflective of kind of um, how grandparents are. Like, you want to have that companion, but you don't have to. You, know, you don't have to have, especially a lot of. You know, they care for each other. That's the purpose of it. Like relationships, a lot of time, obviously not with the newer generation, but the older generation is about yeah. having, you know, being with family, and it's being having the companion. Um, it, it's someone who takes care of you. You're not alone at home. You know, there's someone that kind of exists and breathes the same air as you. Um, and that sort of thing, right? Uh, I mean, it's not, it's not like overly, uh, she's not going to be like, oh, you know, it's not, she's not like a young lady anymore. She's not going to be all fawning over him, right? <laughs> it's all like, oh, my stuff's here. It's so much effort to move. <laughs> So, but um, yeah, the actual uh, at the end when when the um, at the actual wedding banquet and they're playing the sort of drinking games, I thought that was also just really fun. Thing. It just ends on such a very a real sort of high mm-hmm. note. This film does. Uh, it was just a very for a film so sort of based around you know the imminent death of a of a fa- senior family member and and. Just this idea that you're going to be covering up the sort of uh, death of this sort of ever more elaborate sort of scheme. Um, it was a very sort of touching movie. I thought it was. Re- I just just really enjoyed the the whole sort of journey. I think it's one that I need to sort of like go back and rewatch a couple of times just to fully appreciate it. But certainly on this sort of like initial viewing, I really really did enjoy. Um, enjoy it so <laughs> you know yeah I, I, I know it, but you know like i th- like i'm watching it a second time obviously so i have a little bit more <laughs> things that i notice but the second yeah. time I, i'm noticing you know their slow motion thing when you know they have this like whole i don't know orchestral music going on slow motion walking down the street and the first part that she does it she has the argument with uh, the uncle and the dad about telling uh, nai nai about this about this stuff right and then and then at the same time, she and then like she's walking down the street by herself. And then when they intercept that report and then they falsify it, everything goes through. <laughs> you have the whole family walking in slow motion in their like wedding formal attire down the street in slow motion. <laughs> and I really love the whole contrast of it about how like it's become individual, which is what they were talking about, where the individualism mentality versus the um versus just the now they're they're thinking as like a group they're a part of a whole (laughs) it's like yeah it's kind of like um there was a dog shot or to take it back even further the same shot that we've seen quite with currents it's like this slow walk of the group they're all part of the same conspiracy or these sort of players and you could even like say if you're in like that all these players are kind of like it when you look, look at a heist movie. That all these people are just like playing their part in this bigger, bigger con that's been pulled here. <laughs> but when I look at the the family unit, they're so yeah. well cast. Like all the individual sort of faces, everyone sort of like stands out, and there's so many wonderful shots. I think this is the thing with Lulu Wang. Obviously, I don't know if she sort of did it intentionally or sort of like realized it during filming. But there's so many like shots where you see like the whole of this sort of conspiracy group in one sort of like um one shot and they're obviously be, they'll often be like opposite the grandmother who's in the complete opposite shot so you see the camera go back and forth between these two groups and it's sort of like them like seeing if she's like buying it like when they falsify the doctor's report um about b- saying that she's got like benign shadows um to cover up what she obviously has in her, her scan, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, anything else you want to no, bring up on this one? So, for reviewing, what would you pair with this one? I think I've already given <laughs> away my so for reviewing, really, by saying that I would either watch you know, either Ang Lee's The Wedding Banquet or uh, obviously check out Goodbye Lenin, which I think Goodbye Lenin is probably the closest uh, to these films. It's a film that uh, I remember coming out when we had that sort of like big buzz about uh Asian, about foreign cinema again and it's a film in which a, a mother um goes into a coma with uh at the start of the collapse of um the berlin wall 
And when she comes out, that uh, the family are basically told that she can't suffer any sort of shock, so they have to convince her that the Berlin Wall was never fallen down, and that uh, they're still in East and West Germany. And this, uh, the this uh, brother, daughter, uh, brother, uh, sister pairing, who have to like pull this ever, incre- ever elaborate sort of con to try and convince her that they. That society hasn't changed, that culture hasn't uh, changed, as they've got to like slowly ease her into the present, and um, it felt very reminiscent to this film, even though it's uh, this film is sort of like more is more sort of um, a different sort of tact, but I felt that the two play play well, nice together. So those are my certain picks. Anyway, goodbye, learning or the wedding mm-hmm. banquet. So what about yourself? Kim? I mean, I would I would I would definitely say, say wedding banquet is a really good one to pair with this one but i also think that you know just for <laughs> kind of a parallel to all the dinners at the tables and chats i mean eat drink man woman <laughs> kind of fits the bill also um yes. but um i mean my further viewing would uh was um 2019's uh go back to china which is um the second movie by emily ting who also did a a movie that i really love called already tomorrow in hong kong which I literally watch like 10 times a year, apparently. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, Go Back to China is about this girl, this rich, spoiled girl. Um, she's kind of, she's the daughter of, she's pretty much the daughter of a rich man's, uh, she's, the, she's the daughter of the second wife of a rich, uh, rich man in China. And because of this, uh, her father's way to force her to go back to work for the family business is, is after she splurges on this big birthday party, she cuts she, and she stops picking up his phone calls. He cuts off all of her credit cards and her her rent and everything to force her to go back to China to pay off all her debt <laughs> um, <laughs> by working for the toy business. And through this, you know, you kind of see uh, it's also filmed mostly in China, 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 but it's a lot of it is in English. So um, yeah, it, it's pretty much you know you see a lot of the co- uh, a lot of culture clash also and um, a lot of I guess family mentality differences between you know East and West and stuff like that. Um, uh, so in general, a very close pairing to this. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So on that, I've yet to uh, see it myself, but it certainly sounds fun. So um, I would have to certainly give that um, a check out as well. So. Um, but yeah so we here we are at the end of another season of uh, Movies and Tea thank you as always for joining us and Kim I mean has there been any particular one director who sort of stood out for you over this season or that uh, any sort of film that you would like you just really sort of resonated more than the others uh, I mean resonating wise I mean definitely um Raw is one that definitely resonated with me a lot. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a yeah, it's a really good movie for for especially for the fact that it's um, body horror, right? I mean, at the same time, I mean, yes. a girl walks home alone at night is is kind of really nifty and a different take on um, kind of like you know, art house vampires and how that's all done. I mean, it's um, two movies, obviously that are some good finds on this list. Um, but, I mean, I think we had a pretty solid season. Uh, I, I I don't know. I think all the movies had their own accord. I mean, um, Karen Kusama, I've, yeah. I've already seen her other movies. We actually went back to her debut, which I hadn't seen. So, um, yeah, I, I, I've always thought Kusama is a pretty decent director <laughs> so um yeah so I, I mean for me i think that's that's all of them are pretty good i mean standout wise definitely you know the direction of raw and um, a girl walks home alone at night is uh two that i think was the most surprising finds um because i mean half of the season i've already it's all kind of second or third watches so if not more <laughs> yeah I totally um, agree with yourself, though. I mean, certainly, it would go walk home alone, alone at night was just a really fascinating movie. And certainly, having seen her, her follow up film, uh, The Bad Batch, it was great to see her working in, in just like a turn a completely different story again. So, 
I really enjoyed uh, that. But I think overall, I think with the season, it's just been really great to like look at these female directors who are out there making interesting movies and at the same time not falling into the usual pitfalls of when we like talk about you know the exciting female directing talent out there that whenever they, you have these lists produced it's always like the director's doing like period work or they're doing like those really intense family sort of like dramas where everything's grim up north and you're thinking I don't want to watch that um, and here we obviously over the course of the season we had like ladies who just like constantly out there like creating interesting and exciting cinema I mean obviously you can look at like Amy Hackling and who for multiple generations has been revolutionising what the high school teen comedy from like Fast Times at Richmond High into Clueless which we obviously looked at the season we looked at Kusama's like um, Girl Fight which announced the arrival of um, Michelle Rodriguez and gave her the role that we've I think a lot of people have been crying out for her to see without realising that she had done it already um, into like the horror sort of films and just the female sort of approach to horror when we like looked at um xx and we had like wonderful shorts like the birthday party which is uh, on its own i just kind of was an was an absolute highlight not to mention as you said already when we look at raw which is bringing back body horror with that sort of like same sort of cronenberg as flair to it so it's just been a really interesting season throughout and obviously ending tonight with lulu wang's yeah. the farewell a movie that we're yet to actually see her, what she's going to do for a follow-up. Um, but I'm excited to see it already. Hopefully it's uh, it's something that taps into a similar sort of vein um, as, as I, this one. As she's... I don't know if Lulu Wang will take the same vein. Because, I mean, her debut was um, pretty much a through-and-through through American movie. So, um, I, I don't know. I mean, I haven't seen her debut film post Hummus? Humus? I don't, I don't know how to say that word. Um, and, um, but I mean, I mean, I, I would watch it. <laughs> I was looking that up. Maybe huh? she'd be like, yeah. yeah. I was just about to say, maybe she'd be like Ang Lee and just make like really interesting foreign cinema and just really dull <laughs> Western well, I mean, cinema. She, yeah, I mean, she, she started with American <coughs> cinema and I think The Farewell uh, had a little kind of a nice little twist because I mean the selling point was <laughs> you know while everybody says it's based on a true story hers is based on a true lie an actual lie or something yeah. so it was a yeah. <laughs> I thought that was pretty nifty um, but uh, you know I'd really like to see her probably direct Aquafina and something else because I really think you know um, I'm starting to really have this love that you have for her because she's 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 really popping up on the radar everywhere i mean uh, i saw her in uh, jumanji the next level and it was <laughs> she, she had a pretty nifty yeah. role in that one too um i've yet to see um the second jumanji movie but it i remember you'd like message me through and said it's so like oh she's in the new jumanji and so like oh i guess i'm gonna watch that now <laughs> and so um, but yeah, she's also, I mean, she also did, uh, recently launched her comedy series, Nora from Queens, which is, um, sees her co-star with, uh, Bidi Wang and Chang from, um, Orange is the New Black. Um, her chemistry that she has with, um, yeah, she's played Chang from Orange is the New Black is just phenomenal. <laughs> um, her, she's there playing their grandmother and just, again, it's this granddaughter grandmother relationship that they have is just just really phenomenal and i think nora from queens is 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 um just a really great great show and um i think it's up there with like kim's convenience for like the sort of run of like um asian american com comedy shows that we've we've got at the moment uh, alongside the likes you know fresh off the boat but i think those two in particular sort of like seem to be like stepping up a level rather than just doing this sort of traditional sitcom thing so but yeah Nora from Queens I, I think I've been in like two days that whole box set which is great <laughs> so cool um, 
but yeah, this brings us over to the end of another season. Thank you as always for listening. Uh, if you haven't done already, please do hit the like and subscribe button and maybe leave us a review as it all helps to read the profile of the show. You can check out our full archive of episodes at moviesandteapodcast.wordpress.com and on there as well you can find other fun bits of writing including our Friday Film Club where each Friday myself and Kim both pick a film to highlight and sometimes there's a theme, sometimes there's not. Either way, it's a chance for us to share more of the movies that we love with you, our wonderful listeners. Um, we are on Facebook and Instagram so uh, come track us down there and say hi let us know what you think of the show and uh, anything that uh, you think we should be checking out So, but um, when we return our, uh, we are back into Shark Week once again and Kim do you have any ideas what we're going to look at yet? <laughs> do we? <laughs> okay, look at look the reef, at the reef. <laughs> okay I wasn't sure if we, were, if we decided on that yet <laughs> It's the only sort of mainstream one we got left because it's okay. Got it. Okay, I have it. I pulled up the information. Give me a second. <laughs> <coughs> so yeah, we're gonna be looking for um, the at uh, 2010's Australian shark movie, um, The Reef. Yeah, um, one of those uh, shark movies I've yet to see. Um, although it's only really sort of downhill from here. I mean, what we got like. Five Jaws movies and just God knows what else is out there. So it can get. We think we get some like weird Italian shark movies after that. So um, we're slowly running. We're slowly running out of the mainstream shark movies at this point. So, but no, the Reef is one I've yet to see. So, and I think it's one that you spoke. Yeah, I love it. So, I, I've seen it. I think um, two times, and both of the both of the times I really liked it. But it has been a few years, and I have I am a few more shark movies more experienced now. So I don't know if it's gonna feel the same way. Cool. Uh, we'll obviously find out uh, on our next episode uh, when you join us for our Shark Week episode. Um, but until then, thank you as always to my co-host Kim, and thank you to you all for listening and uh, we will be back next time to discuss the reef good night